Hello everyone, welcome to Censorship and the Mass Media. We're going to start with our first lecture today and that lecture is Introduction to Censorship. So let me share my screen with you and then I will tell you what are the things that we are going to cover today. So basically I will talk about the definition of censorship and then I will reflect on some prominent cases of censorship throughout history. I also have an exercise for you, so make sure to cover all the readings. I, I hope you have already read everything that I posted on Blackboard, and also make sure to listen to this lecture carefully as it will be important for your assignment, and I'm pretty sure that you will learn some interesting things from it. So I would like to start, as usual, with the question, um, what is censorship? What do you think censorship is? How do you perceive it? What, when you think about censorship, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? What is it? Is it censorship of arts or is it censorship of books or is it the news? What is it? I'll, I'll tell you what usually comes to my mind when it comes to censorship. So I'm a former journalist I spent 12 years in the media and I've experienced censorship as a journalist, also lived in a country where, where we are still actually struggling for freedom of press. And for that reason, the first thing that comes to my mind with respect to censorship is censorship in the media, where you are not publishing some information because that information could be suppressed or you're even, you can even lean toward self-censorship, which means that you don't want to publish some information because you know that that information could cause really bad reaction. So that is the thing that comes to my mind when I think about censorship. But what I also learned, and that is interesting, when I moved to the United States, that books are being censored as well. I as um, somebody who grew up in Europe, I thought that I was able to read anything. And I was just annoyed by not being able to publish everything I wanted to when I was a journalist. And that is what, but I was able to read whatever I want with respect to the books. So for that reason, uh, my perspective of censorship is different. And this semester, we're also going to talk about how there are different forms of censorship across the globe. And to just go back to that new censorship, why I felt that it was so detrimental for my society, if you don't have the information that you need, it's not just that you cannot organize your day, it's not just that you cannot function properly because you have no idea if, let's say, we, the subway is not working at all. So how are you going to go to work? So you need information from the media to know what to do with your day. You need information to the media from the media because you want to make sure that you're voting for the right person, that that person will deliver their promises. And that is why I get so upset about media censorship. But the definition of censorship is, censorship is generally understood to be the official suppression or prohibition of forms of expression. So one of the, what, what is the form of expression that I mentioned? So this form of expression is related to writing, right? What the key thing actually in this definition is prohibition or suppression of forms of expression. And we have different forms of expression. We can see, um, uh, what are those forms of expression? What do you think? So I was, when I was talking about journalism, the first thing that comes to my mind is basically writing because I, I primarily focused on print media and news agencies when I worked as a journalist. So it is about censoring your writing, but there are other forms of expressions that, the expression that can also be suppressed. So that, let's take a look at some of them. What could be suppressed? Ideas. 
speeches, writing, and images, all of them could be suppressed. When it comes to ideas, what if your ideas are against, against the law or against certain government policy or against religious beliefs? So what is it that actually can be censored? What do you think? speeches, political speeches, speeches that call for violence, images. Um, you probably hear a lot of news from around the world about religious groups that don't like to be portrayed in a negative way and they frequently have um, really, really strong reactions when they see such images in the media. But this doesn't apply just to religious groups. It also applies to political parties, for instance. Politicians don't like to see how, that they're negatively portrayed or that there is a speech delivered against them that portrays them in negative light. But does it mean that that speech will be censored? What do you think? It should be censored in the United States because we have the right to say what we want about that person and their political ideas. We have the right to express our opinion and how do we have that right? Yes, the First Amendment. And I'll touch upon that later. Let's take a look at the background of censorship. Believe it or not, this is a very old term. The origin of the term censorship comes from ancient Rome. So the Latin word censor or censor means to judge or determine. But it had a little, a bit different meaning uh, in comparison to the meaning we have today. So a censor was one of the two officials in ancient Rome who supervised public morals, maintained a list of citizens and their tax obligations known as the census. And now you can say, so why is this important? Well, the censor had the power to remove people from the list of citizens. And then again, so what, who cares? Well, the thing is at that time, if you're removed from the list of citizens, it meant that you were an unworthy citizen. And let's take a look at the modern term. So unlike this censor in ancient Rome who was just able to remove people from the list of citizens, we have something different in, um, in the mid-century in Europe. The invention of the printing press in the 15th century had a strong impact on censorship. And also in 16th century, uh, the modern meaning of censorship was introduced. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't in ancient Rome, it was actually in the 16th century when this term was really introduced and the term that we know today that reflects the same meaning. As books were printed, more ideas came into power, in co into conflict with the aims of those who were in power. And I don't think that you can actually discuss censorship without discussing the issue of power and also religion. Why? Well, this is an example. In mid-century Europe, European printing had to be licensed by the king. Can you imagine today printing your article and going to the president of the United States to license it? Not, let's say not printing your article, but printing a magazine or publishing a website and then asking for a license from the government. So that is how mid-central Europe looked like. The Catholic Church, so it wasn't just uh, political power, also the Catholic Church used the printing press to further grow and increase its impact. But this was like their, uh, its extended arm on one hand, but on the other hand, that arm could also hit the church. Does this, 
Does this remind you of something? Think about it for a second. So they were really pleased to now have the opportunity to print their ideas and further grow their impact on one hand, but then on the other hand, books and scripts paved the way for ideas from the Protestant Reformation. So the church wanted to prevent them from spreading. So what does this remind you of if we think about 21st century? Does that remind you a little of social media? The politicians use social media to spread their ideas. They adore social media because they don't need to rely just on legacy media to reach out to a wider population. They can now reach out to a wider population through social media channels on one hand, but then on the other hand, they also need to confront these ideas from other social media users that are opposite of theirs. They need to confront them. So yes, it is great that we have this, it is great for them that they have this opportunity to reach out to their potential voters on one hand, but then on the other hand, they also need to deal with many people who share different political attitudes and different political beliefs. So this is exactly what happened with Catholic Church. They were happy to print their scripts, but they were not happy that others were able to print their scripts too, and their ideas were different from the ideas promoted by the Catholic Church. So the ideas that uh, considered to be in conflict with religious beliefs would be banned. Let's see the most prominent example from this period. That example is the list of prohibited books or Index Librorum Prohibitorum. It was introduced by the Roman Catholic Church in 1559. These books, that were included in the list, they were prohibited and treated as dangerous to the faith and morals of Catholics. And interestingly enough, the latest edition was suppressed in 1966. You will see that throughout history, we had less censorship in the Western world, but still, the fact that this list survived for such a long period of time tells a lot about, um, about the way religious groups or po other powerful groups, not just religious, but the way they perceive certain groups, the way they perceive um, ideas or written pieces that are against their ideas and their beliefs. Another example that I wanted to discuss that I thought it, it is really interesting is Genou de Maha. Um, you see the painting here. Again, every time I think about censorship, it's basically I'm aware that books are frequently being censored. Movies as well, even songs. We'll discuss that later this semester. But one of the interesting pieces was the nude Maha. That was the painting by Francisco Goya that portrays a naked woman lying on pillows, and that is today a national treasure of Spain. But at the beginning of the 19th century, during Spanish Inquisition, Goya was accused of moral depravity for creating the peace. Luckily, he managed to escape prosecution. And also, luckily, this wonderful painting was not destroyed, so we can still enjoy it. And just a reminder, Hispanic, Spanish Inquisition was introduced in the 15th century to identify heretic and maintain Catholicism. I apologize if um, the microphone went off for a second because I just, I was thinking about switching to my AirPods, but I'm, ju I'm just gonna continue 
this way. So I apologize for that. Let me continue with this. Um, unlike Dunyan Maha that we can enjoy today, we cannot enjoy the Maya goddesses. Why? Because they were burned. So censorship frequently um, led to ruining historical pieces that otherwise, if, if that hadn't happened, we would have enjoyed it today. That is another example that I wanted to mention. An example of religious intolerance during Spanish Inquisition was the burning of Maya codices, the books written by Maya civilization in their script. In the 16th century, after the Spanish conquest of Mexico, these books were burned as they were considered to worship pagan idols, which was against Catholicism. And only a small number of these codices survived. Finally, so during Spanish Inquisition, things were not so great for those who wanted to publish books or those who wanted to express ideas that were different from the Roman Catholic Church. But finally, in the 17th century, we got into the period of or the Age of Enlightenment. So what exactly happened during that period? European intellectuals began demanding the freedom of expression and they were fighting against censorship imposed by the government. This was probably a milestone, but it didn't remove censorship completely. Censorship has never been, and I believe it is never going to be completely removed but we, this was a big step forward. Why? Because in the 18th century, European countries started introducing laws that guaranteed the freedom of the press. At the same time, also in the 18th century, the first amendment was added to the United States Constitution. So I believe at this point, all of you are quite familiar with the First Amendment and what it means. But let me just remind you of the First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I think at this point, um, in college, all of you are quite familiar with the First Amendment, and I'm sure that you've encountered it so many times in other courses that you have. But let's go back to Actually, let's, let's move forward. Um, and now the period of enlightenment was a big step because the freedom of the press was introduced, but it didn't mean the end of censorship. Let's take a look at the 20th century and what was happening then. Um, suppression of the freedom of speech continued to this day. Freedom of speech, not just freedom of speech, freedom of expression in general, in the 20th century, for example, the USSR prohibited collections of literature, primarily from North America. Russia basically didn't want to uh, didn't want the United States to have any to have any influence on its population. Also, you remember how after the Second World War, Germany was and uh, after the Second World War and before the fall of the Berlin Wall, Germany was divided into West Germany and East Germany, and the German Democratic Republic, West Germany, um, it that's another example of censorship. They tried to control the flaw of information through its Ministry of Culture. So even Western Germany that belonged to the Western Bloc after the Second World War and was having developing relationships with 
the United States, the UK, they still had some form of censorship. They were trying to control information through its Ministry of Culture. And finally, when we think about censorship, what do you feel censorship is for? What is the point of censorship? Censorship is still about the contested power of words and images to make actions and the sovereign power over such words used to enforce governmental censorship. Um, as we walk, as we kind of, as I walk you through the history of censorship and I mentioned some of the most prominent examples, you see how religion had really great impact on censorship. But would you say the same about it today? Does religion has that, does religion have that impact on censorship as it used to have? Is it, or is it more, the political power and businesses and big corporation is a them for a kind of gaining prominence in this game, game of censorship. So what are those players, in your opinion, who are actually imposing censorship, who are pushing it, who have the interest that certain ideas do not reach a wider population? Think about it for a second. And finally, what I want you to do at the end of this lecture, brief introduction on censorship, I want you to pay attention to what I was talking about. Also, make sure that you have covered all the readings for today and write an essay about censorship of about 250 words. Explain in that essay what censorship is. We, are, we will be repeating this definition constantly until you learn it by heart because it is important. Explain what the censorship is and what kind of impact is, it has had on society throughout history. What do you think? Another thing that I want you to do is, in your essay, reflect on and cite readings for this lecture. List one example of censorship from this video lecture. So I want you to list one example of censorship that I mentioned, because that will be some form of evidence that you'll watch this video. And I want you to also list two other examples that are from the readings and that I didn't mention in this video. So one has to be um, an example mentioned in this video, and then other two examples of censorship will be um, examples that you'll find in those readings. I want you to post your essay in the discussion board under introductions to censorship. Why, what else I want you to do? So now listen, uh, listen to me carefully. I want really to turn this into a discussion because when I taught this course in person, we had, uh, we had excellent, dis excellent discussions in class and we will have them this semester via Zoom as well. But what I want you to do is, I want to make sure that I get really uh, well-written essays from you about almost each lecture. And I want you to post them by the end of the day. So our meetings are actually um, on Tuesday, so I want you to post your essay by the end of the day, and then I will respond to your essay as soon as possible. After you see my response, you need to respond to me by the end of the week. So make sure to do your homework because both your essay and your response to me will count. I just want to make sure that you are watching these videos, that you are covering all the readings, and that you are reading my feedback as when you read my feedback, maybe I will ask you to find additional information in the readings, or maybe I will ask you to clarify something, 
or maybe I will just say that you did a wonderful job, which I hope so. That that's that's the best case scenario. And then after that, I want you to respond to me. So just make sure um, to check Blackboard and you will see my response to you. And then you will be able to write a response back to me. And at that point, I will be, I will, I will grade your participation for that day. So please make sure to cover every exercise and you will see over a period of time how your essay writing and your understanding of censorship will improve. This is your homework. It is posted on Blackboard. And also, this is a reference list for today. I use Slides Carnival. And if you have any questions for me, you can find me at mpantic at pace.edu. I appreciate your time and your patience. So if you have any questions, just email me and uh, please watch the video. This is going to be an interesting course. Bye-bye.